episode, we leave Venice just as our visas run out and head to Pula. We sail down the coast of Croatia, taking our time to explore many of the anchorages we'd missed on the way up last year. Our last stop is Dubrovnik, a historic town of charm and captivating beauty. First light on a calm spring morning. It's time to bid farewell to Venice. The parkland of Certosa, our home for eight months, is a respite for Venetians escaping the busy life on the grand main island. It's been peaceful, beautiful, and it's only a 15 minute boat ride away from the city. We will miss it. Our route out is a channel about five meters deep, taking us past the Mose barrier and into the open water. Our destination today is Umeg in Croatia. With a bit of favorable wind, we should get there by tea time. So this is it, leaving the lagoon for the last time. This is the Mose barrier, which is saved Venice from flooding, pretty much. Yeah. They had one flood, didn't they, when they forgot to close it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would do it. But it does work. So yeah, this is, this is it. Out of the lagoon, into the sea, back to sailing. I'm looking forward to it. I have to say, getting the sails up. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. It'll yeah. be good. It needs wind first, though. What are you talking about? It's flat calm. It's, it, they said it was going to rain today <laughs> and it's actually beautiful, but uh, there's no wind. It should get quite windy later on. It's certainly going to be enough to, uh, to sail most yeah. of the yeah. Predict Wind said we'd be quite good for most of the crossing. Yeah, I'm just going to do a comparison. Okay. So I'm checking all the different systems. I've got the Savvy Navi one here, which is, uh, if you've looked at the video for that, puts the weather and tide, obviously there's no tide here, but it puts the weather into the prediction and it's saying it will take uh, 7 hours 28 minutes, so we'll get there just before 4. What does um, uh, Navionic say? Navionic says 5. 5, okay. so a little bit longer but that doesn't know about the weather it says on this is slowly increasing wind so light well yeah there's nothing at the moment to uh <laughs> to a there's moderate a ripple one. there's a ripple look there's a ripple yeah there's not enough to sell um so i'll have a look at the the weather apps as well there's some new ones if you uh, if you do predict wind which is the one i normally prefer and it's got a couple of models on there they've added some different models. Uh, one of them is quite interesting. This one, Spire, is something where apparently they use um, uh, satellites to uh, to look at G other GPS satellites, to look at their signal coming through the atmosphere and by the diffraction of that work out what's happening in the atmosphere. So it's supposed to be very good for ocean going stuff, so not so much for local. Yes, you guessed it, still no wind. But we have got the sails up and we are ever optimistic that the breeze will improve. But the swell is making for a rather bumpy start to the journey. It's a little bit rolly. I can see the wind. I can see it. It's over there. It just needs to come this way. <laughs> Only one thing for it now, fishing. Well, we nearly got up to two knots at one point. Is that good for fishing? <laughs> well, we'll find out. I think we can't fail now. We've got all this uh, tackle. This was sent to us by uh, Bill Hall, one of our viewers, who very kindly sends it all the way from uh, California, I think he is. You can tell he's American because the size, of the size of the hooks, you do things big in America. If you're going to catch a fish, catch a big one. They're all like that. I mean. There's these with these sort of cedar jiggles. I must admit, I don't know what most of them are for yet. I'm looking them up. Bill has sent me a sort of list of instructions as well, so I'm going to go through those. Um, I bought myself a rod. It's the best uh, trolling rod I could find. They don't really have them in uh, in Venice because they don't really do the trolling type thing, but it's sort of short. I think the best ones have little rollers on, so maybe later I'll uh, get one of those. But I've got a good reel. The reel I had before was for casting, apparently. And this is a trolling reel. See, they're great, really sort of colourful lures with the, uh, the big hook and a wire trace. I think that, that might be a thing. You see, I've never had that before and I did use the rig quite a few times before, if you remember, and thought maybe a fish had bitten through it. So, can't bite through those. 
for I it. think they had bitten through it. You yeah, caught yeah. loads of fish, Steve. I know, loads. 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 I mean, I would have caught three or four each time, I'm sure. Every time. No problem. We've got these little flappy ones. I think there's one I already had, actually, that one. Uh, and we've got these, which are... They, you tow them along and they flap like that and uh, disturb the top and, and bring the big fish up. So I'll put these on what I used to use, the reel, and then use the rod for fishing. So, let's get some lunch. Which one shall I pick? A small one. What one do you think? A small one. You just want to get small fish. I think I've got to try. I do not want a whale. Okay, let's do it. Not going fast enough for it to pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was locked, it's just not. How much do you have to put out then? Not sure. Okay. <laughs> I have to read up on that. But then I put a bit of a bit of pressure on so when we get one, you can take it but not that fast. And then I think put it in there. Job done. What could possibly go wrong? The flapping bird, that's the technical name, is struggling to actually flap in this very still water. But you never know. An hour later, and we spot what looks like something of a party. There is definitely something happening underneath the water there. <laughs> I think we're going to see dolphins and catch a fish at the same time. <laughs> a thieving frenzy. If you can't catch a fish, go through <laughs> shoal of fish. There is no hope. <laughs> no hope then, I'm afraid. We put the rod away and shelter from the rain. It has come to this, Steve. It's raining. We're playing cards. Well, there's nothing unusual in that. <laughs> we play cards quite a lot. And it is nice in the doghouse when it's raining, but you can see it's pretty grey and miserable. But we're doing four knots now, at least. It's better than having the engine on. It is much better. In the end, we'd have sailed about half of it, I guess. Um, but we're going to get in a bit later, aren't we? Yeah, it says we're going to get in at, well, 8 o'clock. It's drifting between 7.30 and 8 o'clock. That thing I did earlier with the uh, looking at um, all the different weather predictions to try and find out which one's more accurate. Well, yeah. None of them were. None <laughs> of them. They're bloody miles out. In fact, Zavi Navi, I think, was the closest. It said there wasn't much wind, but even that, you know, it, they were out. It's, I don't see how they can get it so wrong. It's just it's rubbish. And in the wrong direction. But we are now with the wind behind us, which is what we were supposed to have for the whole day. Um, so finally, we should be coming in in the right direction to the right place. Um, and hopefully we've got all our documents sorted out and Sunday evening isn't too tortuous. <laughs> got documents. Yeah, I can't find my yellow flag, so oh, I'm going to use a duster. <laughs> but but that would be OK. Yeah, so I hope they're uh, not too grumpy on a, on a eight, 8 o'clock on a, on a Sunday. So, um, yeah. And yeah. there's somewhere for us to drop an anchor because that's the thing. We haven't really planned to stay anywhere other than in an anchorage. No, no, but it's, it looks like there is uh, in the middle of the bay. And I mean, there's, there is a marina there. If they force us to go into a marina, we can, we can do that. But hopefully we can just anchor in that bay, yep. even if we're late. So, yes, we have a new card game. Monopoly without the board. Sacrilege, I know. By now the wind is really picking up. This is even more than was forecast and at last it feels like we're sailing. But as we get close to land and come to change the flags, Steve realises the Italian one is stuck. Rather than go up the mast in the rain, he throws up another line with eventual success. Oh, nearly. Yay! Yay! As we reach the entrance to Umeg, which is quite tricky to get into, the wind is up to about 30 knots. Where's the duster? And Steve is putting up the relevant flags. <laughs> So we're at the checking in point in a well sheltered port before the Croatian oh, flag and the there. duster are hauled up the mast. That'll do for now. It's up. We can't complain. Right. Now let's see what else they need from us.
Passports and our vaccine card, it turns out. Then about £20 to anchor for the night. Well, the sun's come out now. It's, it got really quite windy and stormy last night. Uh, after the rain of coming in, yeah, the wind really got up even more. You can see it in the distance now, all that storm going off and the, and the winds died off quite nicely. So that's nice. We'll get the dinghy off and go and do the rest of our check-in. We, uh, we checked in, there's a, right behind us there is the, the dock just for uh, the, the police, a lovely policewoman that was uh, very friendly and took all our, our details. You didn't have to get off the boat because of COVID. They just want to take the, uh, the documents through and, and do it that way, so that's fine. But we've got to go back and do the bit where you pay all the money for cruising tax and all that sort of stuff with the uh, Harbour Master. So we'll do that. You can see this mooring field that's here. We didn't use that. I prefer in winds just to have our own ground tackle, not that. Uh, just looking at the uh, the anchor alarm where we are you can see there's a boy just behind us here uh, so we've got it just about right the gap between the the mooring field and the uh, the super yachts in the distance over there once we stretched out we're going to go around in a full circle now i think but yeah we'll uh, go on go on shore see how it looks all is well in the morning as we prepare to go ashore welcome to croatia So that's the second part of uh, formalities done then. We uh, had to pay in there on the first floor on this, this office. I think it is just basic a basic tax for, for being here because there's another one we've got to pay online, isn't there? There is. We have to pay for our boat and the days here online. We've just had to pay just over £100 to be here, I think. So it's it's like a tax for yeah. existing on the sea. But the big one's the online one because that depends on how long you're here, isn't yeah. it? And they take in everything to account, how long the boat is, how many... How yeah. many Births you've got all that sort of stuff so we'll find out how much that one is this is the it's the dock. about it's about 200 pounds by the way i've just checked is it us. if we're staying here a month it's about it's about 200 pounds for our boat for a month okay all right good okay that's not so it's not as bad as i thought so then, all up month. 300 pounds just over yeah yeah that's not as bad as i thought and yeah this is this is the dock where you come in normally you'd you just walk across from there you do your uh, there's a nice policewoman there yesterday that uh, actually checked us in but then she said no just wait for today to go in there so but the good news is the sun's come out. Yeah. The sea is calming. <laughs> and I think um, we can get lunch here. We can. <laughs> it looks nice. A bit pretty. Yeah, it's lovely. Oh, this is what I'm looking for. The front. <laughs> <laughs> lunch, okay. lunch on the seafront, shall we? Nice seafront restaurants, but all closed by the look of it. It's a ghost town. Yes. You think if you sit down, the people will magically appear? I don't know. But it seems to be open. Well, I'm not sure. If not, then I'll go to the other This place. is not open. There's, else There's nothing here. open about this place. We'll have to go back to the square then because they were yeah. at the square. Yeah. It's nice though, look at the sea. The sea's really calmed down. Along some more empty alleyways and eventually round the corner, a lovely spot just for us. So we did find a place that was open. <laughs> Julie's got lovely grilled calamari. I'm happy. And veggies. And your meat. Come on, show them your meat. Oh yeah, I've got meat and um, hot sauce as well, so perfect. <laughs> After lunch, we move a little way down the coast. A lovely evening and the promise of a good sail in the morning. It started well. Two lines on the dinghy now. We've learnt our lesson. But as we hit the open water, Fair Isle begins to struggle. It feels as though something is holding us back. I never do quite understand this. We're bashing our way completely straight into the wind. And there's a guy here, probably just about to see. Going beautifully downwind, under engine. What a waste. 
Despite some good wind, albeit in the wrong direction for us, we just aren't making much headway. Tacking isn't helping. The boat is taking water over the bow and healing. Something is very wrong. Well, we're going super slowly, even for us. We've got 18 knots apparent wind and we're traveling at four knots. Something's going on. Steve's convinced it's muck on the hull. I think it must be more than that. <laughs> Who knows? When we stop, we'll go down and have a look. Julie thinks we picked up something uh, <laughs> on the way out. I had a look over the transom. There's nothing. Uh, we're not trailing anything, so I don't think it's that. But you know, we've, we've got um, we've got so much growth on there. I think it's just this upwind. It's really affecting us. We've, we've got weather helm on. We've got quite a bit of rudder on. So it's just slowing us right down. So quite a bit of cleaning to be done, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a bit cold for me, but I'll cheer you on. <laughs> the next morning, it's out with a brush. So have you found the sea monster that's attached to the bottom <laughs> of our boat that was holding us back yesterday? Well, there's things like this, which are little groups of mussels. Can you see those? Yeah. It's a little immature mussels, but I mean, there's not a huge amount, but there's sort of clumps of that going on around it. and. Uh, this is just sort of weed and slime and stuff, but it's not horrendous. But the amount of was slowing us down yesterday and we just couldn't point or anything. So, God knows, we have to really get in. I'll go all around the top end. I mean, obviously this doesn't do much, just the top foot or so. And then it'd be lots of diving in the lovely cold water. <laughs> <laughs> I still sure think it was, love. it was a sea monster. <laughs> She held onto the back of the boat and yeah, was dragging really, us back. It really felt like that. For now, though, muck on the boat will have to wait because there's a storm coming. I think weird weather is going to be a theme of uh, this part of the trip because we've got some, uh, some weird stuff happening again. You can see big cloud formation coming in. Wind's died down now, that heavy wind that we've had today coming up here. The headwind wasn't forecast at all. Um, but what they have forecast is the borer, which comes from there. We can see there's some weird clouds on the horizon and that could be uh, up to 50 knots tomorrow. So we're the only ones in this bay, which is uh, really quite nice because we let out a lot of chain. And uh, so we'll be, we'll be quite safe in here if it blows at us from over there. But actually the reason we, we chose this bay, it wasn't our first choice, looking at the, the chart, there was a, a bay that on paper looks like it's much deeper, much better, but it's actually only looking at the pilot guide, it said uh, it comes down a, a river valley in there if, if the borer blows and uh, really funnels through. So we've avoided that and come in here. So hopefully we should be, we should be good. I'm going to show you this as well. I'll zoom in on it on another camera, but there's a very weird house that Judy spotted over there. If that was a car, they'd call it a cut and shunt. Two cars all put together, two houses put together, what's that all about? Well I've just come up to see if it really is as bad out here as it sounds down below and um, I can confirm that yes it is. <laughs> it's very windy, we've had a very noisy and rainy night, it stopped raining at least. But look, you can see it's pretty mizzy out there. No one's really around. And I think it's going to be like this for another couple of hours. And then we should be able to start heading south. We're rocking and rolling down below, but we'll sit tight for a bit. It's not too bad. At first sight, it looks like there's nowhere to hide on this coastline, but take a closer look and there are plenty of little bays. It's just a matter of finding the right ones. Once you get down further, there's the fantastic natural harbour of Pula, which we visited on the way up. But this time we're heading for the islands, which we know are beautiful. All along, it's pretty rocky. Some are marked, like this one coming into porridge. We opted not to anchor around here anyway because the cost is eye-watering and instead have found the place we're in now, which is free and uncrowded. We also need to further investigate what's clinging to our hull. 
The size where weed usually grows isn't too bad, but underneath the crustaceans have really got a grip. This will take a lot of scraping. At least it looks like there is no serious damage though, and that's a relief. And to celebrate our arrival, Ooh. some elderflower cordial. Lovely. Which I made from flowers I found in Venice. In the last few days of our time on Chateauza, the island flourished, and I couldn't resist the elderflowers. They look beautiful, and I'm sure they'll taste even better. The best thing about elderflowers, of course, is elderflower cordial. So I'm going to make some on the boat. The only slight problem is the lack of the usual ingredients. Now I'm making this without citric acid because Venice doesn't have any. I went to nearly every chemist I could find in Venice yesterday and uh, then, as one does, I phoned my friend Louise, who has sent me a recipe which doesn't need citric acid. So I hope it's going to work. That should be enough. Now these are going to simmer for half an hour and then I will add the sugar. This has been simmering for half an hour or so. Now I'm going to pour the liquid through a tea towel and then add the sugar and lemon. Now this needs to heat gently until all the sugar is dissolved. Everyone tells me that even if it's in the fridge, it's not going to last very long. So we'll just find a nice place to anchor out and drink it. We're going to be on a sugar rush for a while. We are going to be on a sugar rush. But it's lovely. It's some, um, well, we have lots of cordial in England, but here, I mean, they just don't seem to have it at all, which is surprising to me. So I'll make my own. Well, it's incredibly beautiful, but incredibly empty. Yes. There's absolutely nothing. Here we've met a couple of people who've come down with their caravans, but no one on the beach. And it's a nice enough day. <laughs> yeah, no one in the pools. Markets are closed. What was it I said before we left? Let's get some groceries. There are shops in Croatia, you said. <laughs> but they're all closed. Well, there are shops in Croatia. <laughs> we just have to find them. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go on an expedition. We'll find something. I want to find a restaurant as well for lunch. Croatia is ready for the tourists when they can get here. This campsite has pretty much everything and is anticipating the crowds. Yeah, there's a sign here to say you're not allowed to reserve the deck chairs, just in case you attempt it. People. There are people. The campsite next door is much more popular. But it's also a little different. And the summer season means boat trips. But you'd want to, if you were here on holiday, you'd want to hire a boat, wouldn't you? Yeah, I'm sure they do yeah, hire boats. They've got some kayaks over there. Go for a bit of naked kayaking. <laughs> Why not? The season has begun. We feel a little overdressed. Back on Fair Isle, we have visitors in the anchorage. your head out of an evening to see what's going on and suddenly there's a whole pod of dolphins. It's just amazing. The next day was a little overcast so we decided to do some inland exploring. Okay, let's go. 
The Croatian islands are wonderfully fertile. The coastline is famously rocky rather than sandy beaches, and the weather is unpredictable. But as we walk through several holiday complexes which are empty, it's clear that sometime in the past this place has been packed with holidaymakers. Lovely flowers. I think this has been closed for a while, look. It's pretty overgrown and there's no one here at all. Nothing's open at all. Yeah. I wonder when it starts. We're headed for the town of Rovine and along the way we find some places are open. I didn't think we'd find a restaurant all the way out here. <laughs> it's camping. Thank goodness for campers. They're all along this coast. It's really good. There's a lovely coast for camping as well, so I can see why. Rovine is a beautiful old town, and it seems as though any visitors to Croatia are here. Food, history, and cobbled streets. Loads of these wine and cheese places. Really lovely. There's also a busy little harbour. We got a different view of the town the next day from the water. We also had a bit of wind, so we managed a day sail down the coast before anchoring in another beautiful bay. Well, we've woken up to the most fantastic morning here in Croatia after a week or so of pretty iffy weather. Uh, and we've got the perfect anchorage. This is Uvala Saline. And uh, look, it's, it's tree-lined forests all around us. So perfect wind protection. And if you look at it on a map, you struggle to design a, uh, an anchorage better than this one, a deep inlet with a big island in the mouth of it. And it's just down the coast from Pula, where we stopped last year, which is a you know, really nice city. And you can walk to there for, from here. So. It really is nice. We're going to stay here for a few days. We're going to reprovision a bit. For me, that also means finding a good place for running. I've just seen some people walking through the woods there, so that's where I'm going to go. And Steve has volunteered to do the shopping. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> I can buy all the right things then. <laughs> OK, I trust you. <laughs> oh, that's silly. <laughs> OK there. Oh, it's no tide. It's not going to go anywhere. The freak wave comes up. I'm not a great runner, but I am a sucker for a coastal path. So while I set off, Steve takes a more leisurely look around the campsite. Not many people, but at least there is a shop for the basics. On our way back, we spot an ominous sign, no anchoring. Sure enough, when we return to the boat, we're told politely that we have to take a boy if we want to stay. I told you specifically this is a good place, but... Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, we, three years ago we had some regulations just because of that. At least this time it's only £20. I think charging for anchoring is something that us sailors must resist at all costs. I certainly will never pay for uh, anchoring in the open sea. I mean, they, you know, they get away with it. And, in harbours obviously and they're trying it in bays which is you know it's a real problem and they didn't try and uh, charge us to anchor in here but they did make us move to the to the buoy and it's a real shame because you know it's a beautiful bay this and quite deep close to shore I mean obviously before you can see down here they've got uh, posts ready for uh, a bit of stern anchoring so the policy was right in the past and now you know they're just trying to make more money and say you know now you've got to take the boys and and keep it as that which you know I don't know if they carry on down that line I think uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ruin sailing in Croatia and elsewhere as well. You know, lots of, lots of people are filling bays with boys and saying, you know, that's what you've got to do. Um, yeah, we've got to do something about it, really. We're going to try and get uh, all the gas canisters full. He was quite confident. Uh, a chap in the shop that you could do anything but I have got a box of um, adapters which might help um, yes we haven't managed to get this one filled it's no, quite a heavy that's you the realize. problem isn't it it's the adapters 
expected well, yeah, to change I, so I carried much. this about three miles last time on the way up in about August through Croatia to, to a place that uh, said they could feel anything and you couldn't feel this one. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's great if we can because this one lasts for a couple of months, whereas yeah. these, a couple of weeks really, so we'll see. This is quite a big marina with some rather special boats, but the only place for us to tie up is on the far side. Now, this is the closest we can get, it's right over the other side for the uh, for the gas but not too much for a walk easy when they're empty a bit more <laughs> difficult when they're full i hope they're going to be full <laughs> yeah. we don't know yet <laughs> as it turns out the climb was worth it for the small bottles and initially steve thought we may get the big one filled too but in the end that didn't work out but two canisters gives us enough for cooking for a couple of months so result I'm sitting in a darkened engine room because I've turned all the house bank off. I've got a problem with it. If you'd seen the uh, video I made a couple of weeks ago on the Bluetti, the power solar power station generator thing that uh, that I did, I mentioned in there I was worried about our house bank and I was, I was right to be so. I, I could see there was a problem because although the, uh, the battery monitor, we have shunts that are over here. So that feeds the battery monitor and gives you a percentage that the uh, the house bank is charged to. But they can be fooled by uh, by problems with their batteries. And I could tell that was the case because although they were saying they were full, the voltage wasn't what it should be. And you put a bit of a load on that voltage will drop quite quick. So that's a you know, good indication that there's problems. Of course, the uh, the starter battery here is is separate. I can I isolate that one. Um, so that should be fine to start the uh, the main engine, but I've got to look at what's happening with the, the house bank. Um, I also mentioned in that in that video the the fact that it's not really well laid out in this boat just because of space. We've got one battery here, so there's one house bank that sits there next to the starter battery, but then quite a run away from that, all the way through here, there are the other two, and then you can see immediately problem. This one is absolutely about to blow up by the look of it it's, uh, it's really expanded that's not good the other one as well they were warm um, they're obviously shorted inside uh, so sofation uh, problems probably um, odd though because the two that are in here um, shouldn't work as hard as the one that's in there I expected the problem to be with the one in there the closest one so I'm gonna have to disconnect these two so that's all done a moment of truth then let's uh, make sure the actual engine starts although it's uh, isolated you never know when they were together whether fault with that battery because it looks like it shorted out has uh, damaged the starter battery as well so let's just hope she starts okay. that's good news okay, yep yeah, all good Until we get new batteries, we're relying on the Bluetti for charging phones and laptops, boiling the kettle and pretty much everything else. In order to give us some more options, Steve's taking advantage of an exceptionally slow sailing day and putting in some new charging points in the doghouse. At the same time, he's taking a look at how to best use our main source of power, namely the sun. The other thing I've done down here is I'm tapping into the uh, power from the solar because we've got the, the three big panels up there. We certainly didn't, don't need those for our one piddly little uh, remaining house bank battery. So uh, I've chopped into them here, put a couple of MP4s on so I can then just unplug it from there, plug it in here and that feeds the Bluetti. And that's just a lot quicker than doing it from the 12 volt. So that basically will now become our, our house bank for everything, certainly for all the mains off the, off the Bluetti should be fine. And just to answer a question from our friend Lindsay who's got one of these Bluettis and uh, was looking at the connectors I must admit I didn't even see it on here it's got a little plus sign there on the negative cable PV uh, negative um, well that it is odd that it's got a plus sign on it I don't know why to be honest but it, it, he thought they put the wrong connector on but it isn't that's definitely the right connector because that's although it looks like a male isn't it's a female and that is the negative and it does work I mean I've, I've put the tester on it and looked at it to make doubly doubly sure and don't worry about plugging them and unplugging them when it's uh, in operation I mean if it's really got a lot of sun it might arc a bit but so you might just stick something it'll, I stick the wetsuit over the top if it's in the middle of the day but it's absolutely fine the rest of the time you can you can unplug and plug them crystal clear water uncrowded anchorages and patches of seagrass all we need now is a breeze
finally we have good wind and it's in the right direction so we're gonna make our way south I'm gonna get ready actually move some of these cars one of the very few bad designs actually on this boat you can't really move these under load so you have to think ahead and get them in the right place beforehand uh, the other thing I'm gonna do is take all this down obviously before we sail and I'm going to take the battery and put it on the outboard itself and tow it and see if that regen works because this uh, is supposed to generate some power if you tow it along so let's see so let's have a little look we've got 51% at the moment it says so we're not going that far but let's see what we get when we charge as we go Being reached, so I don't need too much tension on the Yankee halyard, so I'll just do it enough to get rid of the wrinkles. I'm going to loosen the main out haul a little bit as well, give you a little bit more belly. Okay, so not much wind then. I'm not expecting this speed to actually produce any power, but let's just see if it's switched itself on. And doing something. Okay. Now look, something's happening. You can hear the whirring noise. The prop is going around. It's making noises. It's 51% of course, but who knows? You might actually get a charge even at this speed, it's amazing. I'm impressed, I didn't think one and a half knots would be enough to turn it, <laughs> but it is. Well, it's flat calm, we're going very slowly and we've spent the day looking at the view. By the time we get there, the sun will be setting, we'll drop the anchor and say that's the perfect end to a perfect sail without wind. As often happens in the Med, things change. This is eight o'clock in the evening and the anchorage we're heading for isn't recommended for overnight stays. But at least the breeze is offshore. expecting sunset to be quite like this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely amazing. I mean we had nothing all day then suddenly about 15 minutes ago it went whoosh literally. So yeah I've got a reef in the Yankee thank goodness and um yeah it's it's gonna be a rock and roll into the anchorage after all. <laughs> yeah we could do with one in the main as well but we're just about to go in the lee of the land here and uh, an anchor so we'll have it down in a sec. Our journey has been just 20 nautical miles, taking us from the northern part of Croatia down to the islands, which are home to some of the best cruising spots in the world. We'd planned to anchor in Mali Lushin, but our rather slow progress and the stormy weather means we spend a rather rocky night here instead. Unsurprisingly, we are the only boat. The next day we head to the main island and plan a visit to the town. We're running low on water and could do with getting some supplies, so we decide to spend the night in the marina. It turns out to be an excellent place to stop. A lovely town, good facilities, though a little pricey at 90 euros a night. That's Judy just bringing the laundry back. I should go and help her really, but uh, she's, she's managing to getting on there. I'm just uh, going to put the battery on the dinghy because we're going to go up and do some provisioning, which is way up there. We try and get everything we can done on our few um, marina stops. We don't like stopping at marinas really. We tend to do it about once every three weeks and uh, that's mainly for water. If we'd got water, I think at the, at the last petrol station, we wouldn't have bothered, but uh, you know, it's the time to get the 
the washing done, get shopping done. Uh, there's no shops here locally. Everything's sort of closed at the moment in, uh, in the smaller places. So we're, we're going to town. It's a chance to do that. And uh, a chance to chop the batteries up to, to full as well. Is that all done? Is that the last load? Yeah, um, there's some uh, sheets that are dry, but everything else is done. Great, okay. So yeah, that's it. Uh, we'll finish off, topping off the, the batteries all in our various devices. As I say, we're doing really well on the on the solar. I think, uh, hopefully, touch wood, if our last remaining OGM battery lasts, we'll, uh, we'll get through to the winter when we uh, redo the whole thing properly. Surprisingly, there's a ferry port here. It's very deep. I think, I think that's why, you know, the big boats can get in here and they don't have a, a gradual up. We tried to anchor, 20 meters so that wasn't going to work <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's sure it shelves off really quickly doesn't it in the whole of this oh yeah there's another fuel dock there yeah there's plenty of fuel docks then <laughs> i think that one does water either by the look of it there no we've just but, found one haven't we last year that yeah. did water what a pretty town though isn't it yeah let's stick it up on the beach over here shall we okay yeah good idea good thing about having a light dinghy you can just Lift, lift it, it up. Sure. <laughs> Even I can lift it. <laughs> Four heavy shopping bags later and we're done. And next day, we're back where we like to be best. Out at sea. We begin anchored in Ist, a small island off the coast of Croatia with beautiful wildlife and a church on the top of the hill. So of course we take a walk up. Ist has a population of just 182 and while visitors are welcome it's still pretty quiet. It's like an alpine road, but without the snow. It's pretty much straight up. A few little respite stops, but no, let's go. We're here. We made it. Yay. It is quite a stunning, stunning coastline. Yeah, this is looking west, so that's the mainland, and there's a string of islands between that and us. And hardly anyone out on such a lovely day. No. They're the only boats I can see in all of this sea. There's an amazing pungent smell up here, which is this stuff. We call it curry plant, I'm not sure what the real name is. One thing about the beautiful island of Ist is that everyone has been vaccinated. So lucky for us, the doctor has some leftover vaccine, AstraZeneca's that vaccine, so we're off to get our second jab. Can you believe it? <laughs> so lucky. You really wouldn't have thought that was the case, that would, that could happen. But uh, yeah, we just met the doctor. It's just a little little village. He said, yeah, come on down. We can we can do no charge. So we're taking him a taking one of our tote bags and a couple of bottles of wine. Yes. Something. I hope he thinks that's a good <laughs> present. It's all we had as presents on board, so yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm so pleased, very happy. 
I still can't quite believe our luck. We are very grateful. Next day, a slow sail with just the Yankee out. And Steve is taking a new approach to fishing. And what are you doing? I'm jiggling my rod. It's what you told me to do. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's kind of fishing in a way that most fishermen fish, which is by holding their rod and at least being aware that it exists rather than plonking it in the pot you've got there and going away. So yeah, anyway, is it working? It's got, well, it's got my full attention. I've got a smaller lure on it than before. I, I got all these, uh, Bill Hall sent me these fantastic lures, but I think he might be a little bit over optimistic with the size of the fish in this part of the med. So I'm trying something a little bit smaller. And yeah, we're going about, well, we're going four knots, so I think that should be fine. Hello, four knots, it's just amazing. Well, I've been keeping a lookout for all the other boats who might yes, be here. supposed to be in charge, not taking the be, Because I'm in charge, obviously. But there's not many out. There's just one motorboat over there you can see. There's been a couple of sailboats. We probably won't get all the way to split today, but you never know. Um, we'll go as far as we can, and then we're picking up a daughter, Chessie. Yeah, Looking Jessie's forward coming. to seeing her. <laughs> it's going to be great. So, yeah, we're on our way. Seems to be a bit of a regatta going on here. There's a whole bunch of boats racing up from behind us, buying our spinnakers and some big four sails. Behind us and then past us, a lovely sight. And then another site in our next anchorage. There are several submarine tunnels along this coast dating back to the First World War. It's actually quite freaky in there. For some reason you feel like whispering. It's odd. Uh, you could actually bring Fair Isle in here. It's, it's big enough and, and deep enough. I think you've got about five metres here. And all these tyres along the side out here. I don't know when it was last used for submarines, but been sort of fairly well kept up. Strange place. It was too dark inside for the video camera, so we took this picture on a long exposure. The next day we head for the town of Sibenik, where we're going to park up and head inland to pick up Chessie from the airport. But first, that strange optical illusion going under a bridge. I'm never quite convinced the mast will fit. Don't like it. <laughs> Looks like you clear it by a couple of metres, but in fact, we've got 10 metres to spare. <laughs> Made it. What a lovely morning. Split airport is now very posh. It wasn't like this last time, okay? <laughs> no, it's new. Definitely new. But very convenient. Free car parking. Seen Chessie's plane land. It was the only plane, so, so hopefully that's the clue. <laughs> hope, hopefully she gets through. And didn't have uh, much luck the other end. They, uh, they gave her a really hard time because coming to a boat, you haven't got an address. So giving her the address at Town Key Sibenik didn't uh, impress them. So it's a bit of fun games. Let's hope she gets through. Completely empty. There it says. I don't know if that was you. Oh Hello. Oh That's bloody quick. I know, literally, they just let me. I'm so sorry, I was so stressed this morning. No, no, I was You weren't too. the only one that was stressed. It had taken several phone calls and tears to catch the 6 a.m. flight. I need to open the car. You're so tired. Don't often wear trousers. I don't. I thought I'd better be smart in case I have to get her out of customs or something. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm coming for quite a while, <laughs> and most of it is your stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Having a car is tricky when you have a boat at anchor, so here's the thing. We drive from the airport in Split to where we parked Feral overnight in Sibenik. We then sail up to the Kirka National Park, 
to anchor for a couple of days. But that means the car is still in Sibenik, which is several miles away. So we're leaving Fair Isle in the lake to go and collect our car. So it's a bit tricky because we've got to go about eight and a half miles down here. And we've got all three of us on board. Jess is here. Hello. <laughs> eight, and a half, eight and a half miles. Eight and a half. Eight yeah. And a half, yeah. OK, so we've got the oars because I'm just thinking we might not make eight and a half miles. <laughs> but we have got to pick up the car and then we're going kayaking tomorrow, so it's worth it. The journey takes a couple of hours in our dinghy through the spectacular gorge carved by the river. I feel like I've been here before Familiar with the view A good time to find the best places to sit. And every time that you walk through the door you can hear the big trucks going over. We also pass floating huts selling mussels and oysters. You open? Right, we need to dive out. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> This one has run out for the day, but at the next stop, we are lucky. Okay, hello. Do you have mussels? And some oyster, okay. Thank you. Great. Great, what do we want, guys? But you want oysters, I want mussels. Yeah. Okay. We <laughs> have um, a dozen. A dozen oysters and... I don't know if I can... I can... Um... Don't try this at home, folks. Now to taste. <laughs> mm. Fantastic. Thank really, oh. really good. <laughs> <laughs> they were lovely. They were huge. <laughs> <laughs> that was so good. Yeah. Okay, we'll have the rest tonight. <laughs> yeah. So you just dive and pick them, do you, or pull, pull them up? No, we go with a machine. We have a machine on the other side. Oh, okay. These freshwater mussels are farmed all along the river and sold by the bucket. Yeah, they're, good. they're big, aren't they? Good ones. There we are, three kilos of mussels. I hope we're hungry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> For about eight pounds. The oysters were a bit more expensive. They're about 12, but dinner sorted. Easy. <laughs> and very fresh. Totally. So we made it, we're here. Yep. We're going to stop for a beer because we're all parched. And we've got 25% left. I think that's a result. Excellent. Well done. Well done, little thingy. <laughs> now we're going to deflate you and put you in a car. <laughs> <laughs> Da -da. Mm. Oh my goodness, wow. they've all opened. Fantastic. <laughs> they look delicious. I think most of them are opened. We don't eat the non-opened ones. There you go. Great, thank you. And then put some sauce on. <laughs> Early the next morning we head inland for this. Kayaking. After half an hour's training, it's a gentle start. We did most of that backwards. <laughs> Time to practice steering. And then we're off. Water is crystal clear but cold. A 
stop for lunch by the waterfall, we went round this one, not down it. And then the grand finale. Five kilometres of rapids. Oh well, <laughs> that's why we're getting down. <laughs> the other must-see place to visit is the Kirka Falls. There are some tourists here, but it isn't at all crowded and the falls themselves are magnificent. The Tesla hydroelectric plant was opened here in 1895, just two days after the first Tesla station at Niagara Falls. Now the plant is a museum and the whole area preserved as a place of beauty. Have you seen the water up there? It's so clear. Amazing. Swimming was disallowed here a few years ago, but after watching several people take a dip, we decide to chance it. Chessie took to the water in style. I'm a little less confident. walrus than a mermaid. We're anchored at the bottom of the river and diving off the boat into fresh water is a rare delight. We are also hoping the fresh water might help clean the hull, but sadly I can now report that hasn't happened. Comedy specials Eddie. Fishing rod in the quiet field. And what I caught wouldn't be big enough for you and I. As we make our way back out to sea, a light wind makes for a gentle sail on the Yankee. With the wind behind us, there's a chance for some sailing lessons.
But of course, the most important activity is sunbathing. We've suddenly found people. We've got an anchorage with uh, other boats in. A bit of a super yacht over there and a, and a nightclub over here with some very loud music going on, which uh, probably won't make this the ideal anchorage, but we're going to go and have a look. This is Carpe Diem, apparently. Does it look like there's anybody there actually at the moment, but maybe they're all hiding in their trees. A strange place. So we're going to go and check it out, see what all the noise is about. You've heard about this place before, haven't you, Chess? No, my friend's been. Um, she said it was insane. So <laughs> <laughs> we shall see. Okay. It's so windy. It's a bit wet. <laughs> <laughs> it's wet. It's windy. It's actually got a bit cold now. And there's no one on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a club with no one in it from this side, but apparently it's all around the other side. <laughs> and you can't bring towels. Oh, yeah, we got a party. There you go. <laughs> Mum thinks you have to wear white. Yeah, well, I'm in white. But I mean, white and black, I don't, does that count? <laughs> yeah, they'll throw you out, Jace. If they throw you out, it's not because you're 50, it's because you're not wearing white. I think that's right. <laughs> strange to have a party like that no covid restrictions last night it wasn't packed or anything and it actually finished at 10 o'clock at night normally it goes on till four in the morning our youngest daughter's been here before and says yeah it's an absolute all-nighter but uh, not in these times maybe they closed early because of covid but it's become a daytime haunt as well because look at this we've been joined this morning by all these super yachts oh my god <laughs> they're fitting him in <laughs> They probably all laid their chains over the top of ours though, so they'll all have to move when we go. We've lost, anyway. haven't we? <laughs> it was indeed time to move on and catch up with our friends from Project Mananya. Manuel and Pina are marine biologists who've been monitoring sea life along the Croatian coastline for many years. They've seen some worrying changes, especially to the seagrass. So you've got some beautiful pictures of seagrass, and I know that's one of the things that you're here to protect. Yes, exactly. So seagrass, especially in the Mediterranean, well, we have a few different kinds of seagrass, and Posironia is really the, the big one. So mm. it's the only one, if you have a jump in the water in the Mediterranean in wintertime and you see seagrass, it's Posironia. All the others mm. basically die off over the winter, and then they grow back in spring. And especially in the northern Adriatic, in the last years we've been losing it. They say about 25% of every species that lives in the entire Mediterranean spends part of its life in the seagrass. So that again means if the seagrass is not there, you will eventually lose those 25%. And you look around, if you go f swimming, most of the fish you see would be lipfish, especially in the shallow waters. Mm -hmm. And all of those, as babies, they are green, tiny sized, and they mm -hmm. hide in the seagrass. And they'll little green fish will just very much stand out if it's swimming over a rock so then it would be easy to hunt yeah i, see. I mean obviously we've got quite a good experiment going on here then because you've had the balearic which for a number of years have been massively protecting it and elsewhere they haven't what what's been the outcome of that has anyone done any research to know how quick it recovers if it does recover uh there is a couple of ngos that are working in spain mm. in the balearics specifically there's um the safe the Met foundation mm. that are pretty active there and the seagrass meadows there are at least not getting worse. Mm -hmm. So they are on a fairly steady point right now, which is a lot more than we can say about most of the other parts of the map. Sure, because it's not just about anchoring, is it? It's about temperature change of water, is it, as well? Yeah, and that's obviously not... So anchoring is really one of many things that influence the seagrass. Yeah. So nutrients is one, the temperature is one, uh, 
dragnets, horrible. Yeah, mm. yeah. And they can take out hundreds of meters of seagulls in one go. Yeah, yeah. But then even a small anchor, I mean, ours is about half a meter wide. Mm. So if you drag your anchor 10 meters, say, mm. yeah, it takes a good 25 years to do for that gap to close again. Yeah. In terms of seagrass or invasive species, most of the work that we are doing is really just jumping in the water and observing what we see. And then you document it, you take pictures and videos of everything, mm. and that's about as far as it has to go. And in recent years there was things like Pinanobolis, like the giant yeah. clamshells. Yeah. They've been dying off throughout the entire Mediterranean. Yeah. And last year we were just getting lucky, taking a picture of one of the last living ones in Croatia. And now I think they're counting seven in the entire coastline. Really? Wow. I've seen signs around saying, you know, protected and you mustn't touch. But they're down to seven. That's that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So seven individuals yeah. along the entire wow. hundreds of miles of coastline in Croatia. Yeah. And the same thing is true for species that come in from the south. So like the, well, by now we have lionfish in Croatia. Yeah. We have puffer fish in Croatia. Yeah. We have the rabbit fish, which is just intruding all over the Mediterranean. Mm. Yeah. And they slowly make their way north. And... Well, then, so the data collection is the one thing, and the other part is getting the word out. And what can yeah. we do um, as non-biologists, non-scientists, yeah. if you like? What can we do to, to, to clean up the environment or, or to make a difference? Well, since you started with cleaning up, <laughs> that's actually something that everyone can do. If you look around, I didn't see a single real clean beach this year. Mm. And we do the dolphin watch as we are on the way all the time. And we also take note of all the rubbish we see floating past. Mm. And on average, I would say we see about a hundred times more rubbish than marine life. Yeah. So it yeah. is everywhere. Yeah. And it's not a lot of work to just take it back with you. And yeah. if you see a lot of rubbish, just pick it up. Now, Pina, I want to ask you, usually there are up to six people here on the boat. What's that like? It's really busy. Everyone is different and uh, depending on the motivation of the day, if we see dolphins, everyone is excited really because we did dolphin watch while we're on the way <laughs> and that day is perfect. But if we don't see any on the way, if we arrive in a new location, if the weather is cold, the mood would be a little down. But uh, if you bake a cake, everyone is happy. <laughs> 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 There are over a thousand islands in Croatia, and in the last episode, we stumbled across this one. Big Ship Party Island was great for one night, but we are looking for a rather more peaceful place to stay for a couple of days while we explore Havar, a wonderful old town with a castle. So we sail around the corner to a bay with just a couple of smaller boats, it's quiet, out of the way, but has a rocky shoreline, so we have to tie in with ropes to the shore. There's also a tiny islet with a small building next door. I think someone might actually live there. It looks like a house. We tighten the dinghy up to keep it out of harm's way, and uh, I've got the choice of, you've know, got the ultra line here, and there's another webbing strap here. So just take one of those out and uh, pull it into shore. I've also got uh, a rope that I made up that I think I've shown before, especially for this, which is, is this. It's just a, a bit of rope with some chain and uh, got two eyes on the end of that so I can just put that round uh, a bit of rock and tie it into that. Tying ashore is a bit of a palaver, but everyone does it here, so it's as well to be prepared. How much depth have we got? A little pull, we just need a little pull just to set it. The trick is to anchor as usual and then put two ropes out to stop the boat swinging. We use reels of webbing. It usually works pretty well, particularly in places where the weather is unpredictable. So we've got a bit of jagged rock here. I've got just about enough, so it's not going to chafe, hopefully. Doing it on here, that's going to be the problem. Chafing on there. Let's maybe bring this up a little bit. Yeah, that's pretty good. I don't really get any serious chafing on that, because by the time it pulls hard, that'll be off that bit.
You don't have to be strong to do this, but it helps. Job done, it's time for a rest and a swim. And oh yes, Steve's daily ritual of trying to rediscover the hull. These little critters have been with us since Venice. The water is perfectly clear here and the fish slice does an okay job. We're still sailing slower than usual, but at least some of the hull is now clear of sea monsters. And it makes a lovely Jacques Cousteau picture. I know, that reference shows our age. Nice, up the side. <laughs> yeah. A bit of downtime on the ferry, catch your lunch. Havar is one of Croatia's go-to islands. It's very pretty and welcoming for visitors. Usually you'll have no chance of just tying up on the quay, but this year, as you can see, it's far from packed. We'll just probably just leave it in here, can't we, one of these? I think any of these are work as a dinghy dock. Lovely place. And a nice shiny ring. Perfect. The market stall suggests some tourist activity, but mostly the town is quiet and, well, ancient. The narrow alleyways and steps lead up to the fortress on the top of the hill. It's quite an effort, but worth it. build them on top of hills. Look at the view, it's amazing. The 13th century fortress was ideally placed to look down on the town and the surrounding sea. It's still pretty imposing. So what do you think is the most impressive? The castle, this enormous triffid, what a lovely view. Look at all those boats out there, Steve. That is the most we've ever seen. I think they're racing. I'm sort of regatta, I should think, yeah. The next day, with a good bit of breeze, we continue sailing. The thing about having so many islands to choose from is that it doesn't really matter which direction you go in, so we can just follow the wind. The only imperative is finding the right place for a workout on the paddleboard. Go on, you can do it. Even better with two. and a bit of help from the engine. This is our last day with Chessie before she has to go back to the UK. It's been a lovely visit. We continue south to possibly the most beautiful anchorage we've ever been in. The smell hits you as soon as you come round the corner. <laughs> and the winds, the wind really has dropped, there's just nothing. Just, we're just surrounded by mountains, it's lovely. Immersed in pine forests, it's peaceful and imposing. Early morning is the best time to visit the Green Cave on the island of Viz, we're told. A hole in the top. I'm not sure I've completely woken up. All right, let's get in the water and see what it looks like underwater. The water is perfect, mystical even, and a swim before the crowds come, sublime.
Later in the day, the wind picks up, so we have to move the boat to the other side of Viz Island and take a buoy. It's not something we like to do, partly because Fair Isle is a heavy boat, but it's compulsory here, so we have no choice. Yeah. What are you doing? Well, I'm going to have to do it from the water rather than the dinghy because the, uh, we pulled the, the mooring buoy well underwater, so I'm going to have to dive to put the second rope on. Okay. With this sort of wind, I like having two ropes on. Well, I like having two ropes on anyway, so let's do it. Our boy was completely submerged and the wind was pulling us back all the time. In the end, Steve had the line through. Take that and just pull it through. Pull it through this one? Pull it through that one, yep. We weren't the only ones having problems. Several boat hooks were lost to the waves. A reminder of the practicalities of liveaboard life is laundry, though it may have been a mistake to go to a laundrette in prime tourist territory. This is the most expensive wash I've ever done in my entire life. Ten pounds per load and another ten to get it dry. <laughs> it's still oh. cheaper than Havar though, wasn't it? What was it in Havar? Yeah, oh, actually, that's true. Havar was twelve pounds. Yeah, we didn't do it. We didn't. <laughs> that's true. Anyway, I hope it works. If it works, and we're also going to hang all this on the boat. So, yes, it's going to be a big wash day today. Time to explore the town and some dubious manoeuvres on the town quay. Ouch. Viz has only been open to tourists for the past 30 years. Before then, the islanders enjoyed splendid isolation and at one point even minted their own money. But now the ancient streets have been discovered and made famous. Mamma Mia 2 was filmed here. This dress might look very pretty on. You really don't know me at all, do you? So we went looking for film locations. It says this chapel was built in 1462. But the real attraction today is, of course, Sophie's house. This way. Google Maps says this is the building. I could be wrong. At least it has given us time to dry the washing. The next morning, the wind really picks up, but in the wrong direction, which we take as a challenge. We are headed for Dubrovnik, but we have a few days in hand, which is just as well, especially if you can't go in a straight line. Well, a lot stronger than we thought. It's great. <laughs> Woo. There's also rain forecast. So enough wind to tackling. Yeah, look, it's good. We'll have to tack every 
10-15 minutes because <laughs> it gets quite narrow further down but yeah no I think it's going to be good okay well, that's going to be make uh, making breakfast uh, interesting then because uh, just trying to get a bit of a fry up going down here we uh, you never do proper fry ups that's the problem because kind of bacon not that uh, that worries Judy because you know she's got all veggie on me I think we can't she doesn't have that so it's going to be mushrooms egg on toast all that sort of good uh, veggie stuff uh, this butter I'm not sure I've cracked the butter thing this uh, Croatian I'm not sure if that is Croatian for butter this looks rather like margarine to me which isn't great but uh, whatever we'll see how it works While we eat breakfast, we take a quick look at the map. The predicted straight pink line is about 12 miles long, but this is our route. So that's why sailing takes all day. It's worth it though, we do have time and we get to see more of the place. And anyway, tacking is fun. So it's been quite a lot of tacking up and down here, short tacking. We haven't had the staysail out. Uh, you go a bit quicker and it's better with it, but yeah, it's very short tack, so we haven't bothered. But to do this, staysail obviously is still in the way. Because the, uh, the inner stay is there. But it's okay, because what you do, don't get carried away trying to pull it around. Wait until the sail is up against it. Let the wind bring it around, but then be ready to go fast. Because then you don't have to do so much winching. So as soon as it's slipping around, like it's up. Nice and fast, and actually, you'll see, I'll have the only winching left to do. So Judy just pinches up a little bit to help me. Get it wound it to where I want it. Just get on the fastest course. That should do us. And then look at those. I could watch this for hours. Others opt to motor with the wind behind. Each to their own. Everywhere you go in Croatia, there are ancient cities. This is Korkulia, which we don't have time to visit. But just around the corner is a wonderful monastery and an anchorage. Just the place for us. The alarm call is free of charge. Just having breakfast this morning and it started to rain, which is actually very good news because if you look at the state of our, uh, our boat, uh, this is what it's like when you don't have a water maker to uh, have enough fresh water to wash things. Look at that. This is the horrible sandy stuff that you get with these little bits, bits and spots of rain which we've had over the last day or two. Now we've hopefully got enough of a downpour that I can actually give it a bit of a wash. I hope the rain keeps coming. A DC water maker is our next big purchase after the battery and maybe some other things. Boats. Mustn't forget the solar panels as well. We might get twice the power out of it after this. The rain eventually stops and we continue our journey south. More beautiful coastline and a light breeze. But however beautiful Croatia is, and it is stunning, 
Nothing prepares me for this. Dubrovnik Old Town. Breathtaking. This ancient city is majestic, haunting, and I'm acutely aware of how privileged we are to be traveling. It's no surprise they had this for the Game of Thrones, is it? It's made for it. It's amazing. Just go over the brow of the hill and down, and that's your sight. That's just amazing. And we have the place to ourselves. It's stunning, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. Just lovely. Everywhere you turn, it's just beautiful. So if you've watched Game of Thrones, you'll know that this <laughs> is the point that Cersei did the walk of shame. Judy's going to reenact it. I am, yeah, so absolutely. Just, just a minute, I'll uh, hide behind and take my clothes off. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, so we couldn't resist that. Sorry, Cersei. Game of Thrones fans will understand. There's even a fountain to cool off in the heat. That's better. Cool. We spend a whole day walking and still don't see everything.